My name is Courtney Colson, a female to male to female detransitioner, and on this channel we try to figure out just what the hell is wrong with me. In this episode, we'll be listening to a couple of my podcasts over the past 15 years or so uh, to compare and contrast how my voice has changed. So, this is something that a lot of people focus on when it comes to detransitioners, especially female to male to female detransitioners, our voices don't really go back to the way they were before. Since I've been doing these videos, I've had every single opinion you could probably have on my voice. Some people say, no, you definitely sound like a man. It's disgusting. You gotta change it. Uh, people recommending I do vocal training. And there are, there, then there are the people I, I, I do like who just go, oh, I could listen to you talk all day. I, you have that husky, deeper tone. It's very appealing. So, yeah, I, I guess voice is one of those things that it's very subjective and it's especially hard for you to hear how you sound objectively. I mean... I've been podcasting since 2009, so I'm definitely much more aware of how I speak and where I'm speaking from and all of that. And while I don't speak as low as I used to speaking from about there, I'm probably naturally speaking a little higher. I'm not trying to speak from the throat and be all high and girly and ah. No, I'm not really interested in that. And I never was, I think. I always hated my voice as a girl because it was so high and squeaky, it lacked authority, and part of that is just, well, I was a kid, I was <laughs> listening to one of these old podcasts, it was funny because my mum interrupts our recording at one point and I say, I'm a god mum, I'm podcasting, it's very important. So <laughs> I just put things into perspective for me where I, oh, yeah, you were a shitty teenager, and you were talking like a valley girl, because that's kind of what you were. <laughs> By the way, I've just I've decided to embrace the Elizabeth Taylor thing. Everyone in the comments is just saying, You look so much like Elizabeth Taylor. Okay, okay, I'll do it. I've done it. <laughs> You're happy. Um, so the first podcast we'll be listening to, as I said, 2009. It was called Podcast X. Please don't listen to it. It's kind of hard to find now if you don't know the particular URL. But, um, yeah, I, <laughs> how do I even explain that? So I was, um, well, I got on the podcast in 2009. I was probably talking to them a little while before that. So, oh man, I mean, I don't know if you even care to hear the whole backstory, but there used to be, or there still is, a community called Scans Daily, where people, it was big in the Slash community, people would... Slash, which is male-on-male -male pairings of characters, just in case you're not aware. My whole life is incredibly geeky, I'm sorry. But, yes, so Scans Daily was where people who were into that kind of stuff would share scans from comic books that they were into, and, yes, yeah, some of it was homosexual stuff, but a lot of it was just cool, interesting things. There was Context is for the Week, which is funny panels out of context. And in there, I found a guy called Trenchcoat Mafia. Yes, Trenchcoat Mafia, which I didn't get at the time because I was probably about 15 or 16. So 2009, I was 17. I do my first appearance on Podcast X, and we just review old comics. A lot of them very strange, very obscure, controversial ones, but my first one was... Just some Venom comic, because I was really into Venom. Still, still into Venom. But, well, I think that's all the backstory you need to know. But, boy, does it take me back. 2009 was a really different time, just in terms of the technology we had and, and all of that. Because I remember I had... I did have a PC. I didn't have a laptop. I had a PC, and I had this MTV... Uh, screen that was also a DVD player and a TV all in one. You could use a computer screen, and I had my Batman Begins mouse pad. And actually, I think I've got a photo. I've got to put a photo of my bedroom from that time up here. Wow, it really shows you how much you change. I think interior decoration. It's it's like costume, just for your surroundings. 
and I was recording on a gaming headset. It was a Logitech. Logitech's pretty good, actually. Logitech, I... I if you're going to use something like that in 2009, you could have gone with worse. So uh, I apologize if the audio quality is not up to our modern stands, but here we go. You know, Trekkie really should replace the locks to the Hall of Shame because it was way too easy to break in. Yeah, but it doesn't look like he's really trying to hide anything in this dump. Although, that uh, door over there, all those locks, makes me think he's trying to keep something hidden. wonder what it is. Oh, I know, a mad scientist lab. I don't even care. As long as, you know, we implant the device that Starhawk gave us, and we get out before Trekkie catches us. Okay, you go do that. I'm going to open this door. I can't. Hairpin? Always handy. And turn the lights on. And... Hey, trench coat! I was right. It is a mad scientist lab. Oh, get the fuck out of here. Huh. <laughs> Looks like Professor Venture designed the place, though. I know. It's so lame with the little beakers and, and science stuff, Bunsen burners and Yeah, shit. look, I, I've seen like t- way too many old horror movies because I expect a proper mad scientist lab to at least have like a giant Tesla coil. There's one over there. Oh, well, okay then. Let's steal that. <laughs> let's, let's let's see what else we can steal. Ooh, there's a there's a tank with uh black goopy stuff in here. I should call it psycho licorice. You know, it looks like fucking psycho licorice. I wouldn't get too close to that because that goop looks like it's fucking alive or something. It is. Hey there, little guy. I'm gonna get you out of there. No, 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 Courtney, don't let it out. <laughs> Uh oh, it, it stuck to me, and it's cold and it's sticky, and I can't get it off. Oh, try to get it off, get it off, get it off. I'm trying to get it off. It's stuck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that was podcast X, where we did a little skit in the opening, and I don't know why, but I have always made friends with people, like, twice my age. Mostly men. It's a bit worrying. But no, Trenchko and I, we were just really close friends. I never got the in- impression that he was trying to do anything with me other than that. It's just, we really bonded over comics, and we talked almost every day. I think, well, I hope that everyone has that one person in your life where it's just the two of you talk all day every day just that the one bestie and i've definitely had those throughout my life we just yeah there's just that one person you really really click with and i tried keeping in contact with him every once in a while just check in we always friend each other on facebook when we make new accounts and we'll just say hey every once in a while but that's about it but i really appreciate that time because I probably wouldn't have had uh, an opportunity to get into podcasting with the help of more experienced people. And yeah, I, I've been basically been podcasting ever since then. I never really did videos. I wasn't into vlogs or whatever. I've, I, I think it's because I grew up with cartoons. I loved voice acting. And I, I always wanted to be a voice actor myself. Which I've never actually done. Oh, I mean, I've done some things, not really professional things, but but that is very much something I would enjoy doing. I don't know why. I think it's maybe because you don't have to memorize the script. You can just focus on the voice. Doesn't matter about you know hair and makeup and lighting and all. You can just microphone you doing a voice and and I've always loved doing you know, cartoon impressions and animal noises. I was that kid. You know, Back when Lord of the Rings came out, I was always doing my Gollum impression. And yeah, uh, I was the performing monkey for my class. So what do I actually have to say about my voice in this episode in particular? Well, there's not a lot of vocal control and I'm talking really fast and really high and there's no... Absolutely no practice whatsoever. At this stage, yeah, I would have been doing a lot of impressions and and mucking about with my voice, but actually learning to speak 
with proper elocution and diction and all of those things, I really didn't have. And then you also have to factor in that I was autistic, so... I mean, some autistic people cannot even hear tone of voice at all. I've been watching that uh, Chris Chan 50-part documentary series on YouTube. I uh, can't remember who does it, but you can find it easy enough. And people will do these really over-the-top voices at Chris, or he will do these really weird tones and inflections in his voice, and I don't think he can tell. And this is something I notice a lot with uh, the, the weeb kids, the anime kids, where they'll kind of get this weird, over-the-top, fake American accent thing going on, and yeah, I not that I was a weeb, I think I was watching a little bit of anime, but not as much. Actually, I'm probably watching more now, because I'm trying to learn Japanese, than I was back then. But I was definitely picking up that kind of fake voice that a lot of teenagers do, especially girls when they're kind of being all playful and silly and stuff, and oh my god, yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't even think I knew I was doing that. Oh, and my favorite part in this podcast was where I get interrupted by my mom, and it's just, oh, wow, that's, that's who I was at 17. It really just mm, transports me right back in time like a DeLorean. Here we go. Anyway, yeah, because, you know, fuck her, she's Hang on a sec, there's someone at my door. What? <laughs> oh, you got to run away then. What do you want? Well, you can't have it right now. I'm podcasting. <laughs> I'm a dishwasher. Give me a fucking drawing pad. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, let me guess. Once again, I got your, I got you in trouble with your mother. No, um, Dylan wanted my drawing tablet, and my mom's like, well, while you're out, you should unload the dishwasher. Does it look like I have time for that? No, you're podcasting, damn it. Important stuff. So, number four. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the reason why people cringe when they think of past memories, is they don't quite realize how much they've changed. They're still holding themselves to their present standards. Like, if I was talking like that now, i go, am I drunk? What is wrong with me? But I, I just think that's really cute. And, I mean, it is nice to see how much I've changed in that time. But also, it just it really puts things into perspective, especially because I want to have kids now. So I'm suddenly thinking of it from the perspective of being that kid's mother and my kids being teenagers and behaving like that. So yeah, I, I regret nothing. It, and I'm glad that this was archived for me to retrieve. It's a very, just a cute little, cute little memory. Um, and you can hear, I, I think, how much Trenchcoat and I were friends. It's very cute. But yeah, again, that's sort of doing this kind of cartoony baby voice Cartman thing. I didn't even know what the fuck I was going for. Um, apparently I went through a phase where I was talking like Stewie all the time. So that's also not great. <laughs> and I think that really does just come from, again, autism, not really knowing how to speak confidently and clearly. Uh, although I think the Stewie face was probably my answer to that, where I was trying to elocution and being a little bit more clear. No, you just fucking sound like Stewie Griffin. Stop. Please stop. And my next podcast is The Book Was Better from 2013. That's with my friend Luke Milton. We did a lot of photography. I, I modeled, he did the photography together. We did a project called Cosplay Couture, which you can still find. Team Couture.tumblr.com. We might be doing another shoot at some point in the near future. Maybe, maybe. Keep you posted. I met Luke through modeling. So I had another friend who was a model who had worked with Luke, and she said that I should get into cosplay modeling. So we met up, and then just, again, one of the most intense friendships I've ever had in my life. I, I've probably maybe had three or four of those, where it's just you are so much on the same creative wavelength. You just... I don't even know how to describe it. It's just this intense platonic love. And it's always a little bit weird and people around you don't get it because, you know, I was 
uh, let's see, 2013. So I, I was 21. But still, you know, a young girl hanging out with a man about twice my age. And he was already in a relationship. But it's just... Yeah, we're like brother and sister. That's all it was. And we would work on writing projects. We would have sleepovers and watch movies on the floor together. It was just... Wow, you, you don't get friendships like that very often, especially in adulthood. And I wish we did. Why why can grown-ups not have slumber parties where we watch Gremlins and Troll 2 and all that good stuff, you know? <laughs> the Book Is Better was a podcast that was about, well, as the title sort of suggests, comparing the movie novelizations to the movie. And movie novelization, so this is not the book that the movie is based on. This is the book written to promote the movie. It's a very strange underground world of movie novelization. Back in the day, this was the only way to re-experience a film. So if you wanted to go see Star Wars, well, you could go see it as many times as you like in cinemas. And many people did. Uh, it, the box office on that was insane because it was in cinemas for so long and people were seeing it over and over again. I don't know how many people watch movies more than once in cinemas. I've probably seen, I think I saw The Dark Knight twice in cinemas. But that's because a friend of mine wasn't around the first time I went to see it. So yeah, usually I don't. But yeah, novelizations, people really relied on them at one point to allow them to really get into these details of the film again and re-experience it. And then VHS became a thing, and so novelizations... Films is really weird middle ground of... Well, they don't really cost much to write because they, they don't pay the writers very much and they can churn them out in a couple of days or a week. And you can really tell. You can really tell that there's not much effort put into a lot of these, especially the newer ones. The one I reviewed was Supergirl, the 80s movie, which is terrible. And the book was about the same. It's not considerably better or worse, but okay, that's all the backstory you need. Let's listen to my first appearance on The Book Was Better. The book was better. Hey, Courtney, hello. And uh, I've got to say this before anything. The greatest thing about this is that you are actually doing this podcast while dressed as Supergirl. Mostly, yeah. It took the wig off because it's a bit warm in here and, and the cape. But yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> it's me, John Robertson, when he did Star Trek. He didn't put on the bald cap, go that extra mile and come on here as Picard. No dedication. Absolutely. So you'll see those pictures. And the significance of this is that... Uh... No dedication. No dedication. Like, I can't even fucking make my voice go up that high. I just don't even know. <laughs> Uh, that's how we've met. Well, one, you know uh, more about pop culture than a lot of people that I know, particularly comics. Yeah, I have uh, almost... Well, yeah, I have Asperger's, so I have an Asperger's level uh, of obsession over things that I like. <laughs> so, um, you know, your knowledge there. So Supergirl seems like a, a, a really good fit. Uh, and you make a lot of costumes as well. Too many. Too many. I've seen your... Um, you've made Loki, you've done all sorts of different cosplay costume things. I'm a photographer, we met, we took pictures, and uh, now we get to talk about a crappy yeah. movie novelization. I don't think I could get my voice that high, even if I tried. I mean, maybe if I continually practiced, but it's not what I want, it's not what I find appealing. Uh, and I was actually thinking about what I find appealing in other women is a husky, a deeper voice, obviously this Scarlett Johansson, uh, that Catherine Hepburn voice is great, or Catherine Janeway, if you will, basically the same. Uh, I actually made a little, little list of the other voices, like uh, Claudia Black, uh, who you might know as Vala in Stargate, and she's also in Farscape. Uh, Mary McGlynn, who is the Major, Major Matoko Kusanagi, in Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, and just, there is something really cool and powerful and badass about those voices, and those women often tend to play those characters. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do that kind of happy birthday, Mr. President, kind of breathy bullshit either. I'm not, yeah, no. When I first detransitioned, my voice was as deep as it would ever be. And part of it was 
deliberately pushing it down as low, although this is probably not as deep. Um, this is my Garth Knight voice, yes. <laughs> Mark my words, Michael Knight will die. <laughs> um, or can be my Batman voice, I guess, if I make it a little uh, husky. Hang on. Where is she? There we go. <laughs> but it's really not that deep. I probably sound like a, a teenage boy at most. And speaking of, I'm basically going through this reverse teenage boy puberty, so I, I feel I have to restrain my voice a little bit. I can't have as much, you know, range. But yeah, I think at this point now, so if I answer the phone, I'm not really thinking, it's like, yeah, hi, uh, what do you want? You know, that kind of stuff. It can sound quite masculine, but otherwise, most people assume I'm female, especially because if they're calling me and they know my name, that helps. I am very fortunate, I, so I did not take a full dose of testosterone, I couldn't handle it. I probably was on the full dose for maybe a few weeks and then realized, no, this is not working, so itty bitty dose. So my voice isn't as low as it could be, and I'm very grateful for that. You know, I really, I could have done a lot worse to myself overall. But I find that the girls who have detransitioned and they do have that really deep voice, and then they try and like pitch it up and be all and, and do the kind of lisp and the effeminate thing. Then you just sound like a drag queen, honey. I'm not, it's not really, yeah. Kind of making it worse. So I think I'm kind of working with what I have the best one can. So not that there's anything wrong with sounding like a trans woman or, or a gay man, but I'm not either of those things. So I try and speak with fairly neutral affectations, so, you know, no upspeak, no vocal fry, no lisping. Yeah, I try and make it a bit breathier and softer, but not so much that it sounds like an affectation. So, personally, I'm happy, and, you know, I spend hours and hours and hours editing my voice, and I don't have a problem with it, although, past couple of recordings I've done, um, I was on the Airwolf Years podcast, which is great. If you like Airwolf or Knight Rider, they've also done that. So the Airwolf Years podcast. That's where, uh, you know, I'd f just woken up. We recorded like 7 in the morning, which is fine for me. I wake up early. But I was listening back and going, mm, yeah, my voice is a little bit rough. My voice is still kind of detransitioning. So it's a little shaking in parts here and there, and I, I don't feel it's my best vocal performance, but... Otherwise, I think my other podcasts sound good. I'm happy with it. My listeners enjoy my voice, apparently. So, yeah. I don't think it's a huge problem. I think a lot of detransitioners or people who are questioning their gender, you know, they've transitioned, they've taken the testosterone, they've changed, and now they think, mm, no, maybe this wasn't right for me and I want to stop. Oh, no, I can't because I sound like a man now. Well, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I, I'm here to say if you detransition, a lot of things are going to change back to the way they were before, especially if you transitioned later. And if you look feminine and you've got the deeper voice, a lot of people don't even notice it. They'll just overlook it or they'll just go, well, okay, well, the voice sounds like this, but it clearly looks like a cisgender woman. And for most people, the voice does just get a little bit higher. I don't know what that is, because once the vocal th cords thicken, they don't th thin back down to the way they were. Uh, you can get surgery, apparently, on your vocal cords, but it's very dangerous, very experimental, and apparently it doesn't even last. Or you could just be rendered mute the rest of your life, so not really worth it. And as I mentioned before, there are plenty of uh, voice actresses, success successful voice actresses, who do have deep voices. It does just happen to some women. And I notice the people who complain the most are either men, who I'm not trying to appeal to you anyway, so I don't care, and then old ladies. Old ladies are really judgmental. If I've learned anything from my mother, old ladies are judgmental. <laughs> the only real regrets I have about transitioning is that I have the Adam's apple. I don't know if you can really see it. I mean, on some angles it's quite obvious, but I think for the most part, especially the way I film it, you probably can't even see it. It's not that... I don't know, get on the side there, I don't know, yeah. Um, 
it's not that pronounced and no one's ever commented on it. I still have to shave every day. That doesn't seem to be getting better, although some people say after a year, a couple of years, suddenly all the facial hair just fell out, so here's hoping. There's no other changes. My body's basically gone back to the way it was. I'm more muscular and yeah, no changes down there. A lot of people want to know about, well, so did the clitoris change? No, for whatever reason, I didn't, I, I suffered from pre a lot. Nothing changed down there other than that. And for me personally, I, I know I got really lucky. I don't really know what my situation was, but I didn't seem to go through female puberty properly. You know, I was menstruating, I had some breast development and all that. And so I thought I, you know, that was it. That I had, this is as mature as I'm going to get. But I was asexual and I was quite childlike, although part of that has to do with autism. And then I transitioned and not much of a change still had some of those male puberty changes, but not a lot, especially because I was on a low dose. Then I stopped taking the testosterone, and then suddenly I have a libido, I have breast development, I'm very womanly, and the fact that I have a deeper voice, in contrast to all of everything else in, in, this, uh, in this set, in this particular package, if you will, doesn't really matter, it does not worry me. And, honestly, if every comment I got on my videos was that I sounded like a man and it was disgusting, pff, I honestly couldn't care less. I, I'm happy now. I feel more confident overall, but particularly in my voice. That when I speak, I can hear it resonate in my chest. I feel like I, I, I'm commanding more attention and and more control in a conversation because i think i mean it's hard to say when you listen to these podcasts that i've used as an example i was so young so it does sound like just this little kid you know just talking about whatever bullshit and yeah there is a definite power dynamic there even though trench coat and luke well, my besties, and we were on that same level, there's still that age difference, and you can tell they're kind of, I don't want to say tolerating me, but humoring me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, the way you talk to a little kid. Whereas now, especially as a host of too many podcasts and having guests on, and I'm the one in control there. And I'm the authority. And in these videos as well, I just... I, I, I have a lot more trust and confidence in that what I'm saying is valuable and I'm delivering it in a way that is effective. And I, what more could you want? It really doesn't matter how deep or high your voice is. It's being able to speak with that level of control and awareness and pacing and, and all of that things i just didn't know as a kid and i have to wonder if i had proper vocal training or just public speaking charisma training i don't know if that would have helped because i was autistic at the time oh yeah and i'm no longer autistic that's a whole other video go go watch that um but yeah just lacking those that's the social graces, that social awareness. If I had at least some confidence in myself and my public speaking skills, would I have felt the same social dysphoria? I don't know, maybe. There's just so, so many elements of my, I don't know, dysphoria, my mental illness, whatever you want to call it that come from all these different aspects of my life. And that's what this series is about, essentially, is tr focusing on particular aspects of my life and how that may have led me to, well, the biggest mistake of my life in transitioning. So I think that's everything I had to say. I think that basically covers this particular topic. But otherwise, see you, Space Cowboy.